All right, so uh, as Jonathan very clearly pointed out, and I won't spend time on, um, for the 20% of people who are going to die with follicular lymphoma, or from follicular lymphoma, I should say, uh, I 100% agree that we need to uh, try to improve their outcomes uh, and uh, so that we can both improve their quality of life and obviously their quantity of life. For those 80% who are going to die with follicular lymphoma, um, the focus is really on how to make their quality of life better. So uh, I think that we recognize that in follicular lymphoma. And for the patient we talk about, for four out of every five patients in our clinic, um, it's all about quality of life. And uh, so I think we need to keep that really very much in mind. I think we also need to look at the data, and Jonathan showed you what's there on the left. We know that Rituximab added to chemotherapy improves survival. And we have, uh, we have data with RCVP on the right, we have data with RCHOP, and we also know that our bendamustine is very commonly administered to this group of, of patients. So using an anti-CD20 in the form of rituximab uh, has clearly improved overall survival, the key parameter. We also know that uh, there is a benefit to maintenance rituximab after our chemo. Uh, when that our chemo is our CHOP or our CVP, this is the PRIMA study. And uh, the question here to some degree is that while there is a benefit to rituximab maintenance, and you can try to draw out where the two-year PFSs here are uh, in the scheme of this, I think it's a little bit tricky. Um, but in any event, these progression-free survival benefits do not necessarily translate into overall survival benefits, um, despite some of the points Jonathan made. So I think we need to keep that in mind. Does the choice of initial therapy matter for overall survival in follicular lymphoma? Well, I think it's pretty limited. The only survival benefits, the only difference between treatment A and treatment B where there is a difference in overall survival is when we're choosing to use our chemo versus chemo alone. We don't know that watch and wait affects uh, overall survival, so far it doesn't seem to. We don't know that R alone versus R chemo affects overall survival one way or another, although that hasn't really been tested. We don't know that R chemo versus R chemo affects overall survival one way or another. You can plug in different chemo regimens, and I think we would all say it's still debatable. And just to reiterate, we don't know if R chemo versus O chemo, in the case of obinutuzumab or other options that are out there, affect overall survival one way or another. So overall survival uh, is still not, at the end of the day, been impacted um, by any of these changes as long as we're using rituximab as part of the initial treatment. So then the question is, and again to go back to quality of life, there are probably quality of life differences between the approaches we choose. To the extent that quality of life correlates with PFS, if the patient's in remission longer, and if that makes quality of life better, then, then clearly PFS is important, but perhaps not. And to the extent that quality of life correlates with the treatment-related toxicity, the duration of therapy, the inconvenience, the disease-related side effects, all of these figure into the patient's quality of life if that is the target of, of our therapy from the standpoint of benefit to the patient. So what are the usual options? If this patient comes into your clinic, and just to reiterate, this is a patient who's borderline low tumor burden. It depends which classification kind of on the fence, although he is just barely flippy high risk based on his age, stage, and number of sites. I think it's still reasonable that you could push this patient to be observed for a while, although he wants therapy. You could certainly give this patient rituximab single agent, either four doses or uh, eight doses according to the SAC regimen. We probably wouldn't use maintenance therapy after rituximab based on the resort trial. Bendamustine rituximab, certainly a very commonly used choice. Uh, we have no good data, I would say, of maintenance rituximab, although if I went around the room, uh, I'm sure there are plenty of people out there that sometimes use maintenance rituximab after BR, and I think that's reasonable, uh, although uh, one could argue that we don't have great data for that, and that's an extrapolation. Uh, we have our CHOP, and again, we could do that without maintenance, or we could add maintenance, again, for the PFS benefit as per the PRIMA study, but without an overall survival benefit. And then certainly we could do a clinical trial. So we have lots and lots of different options for this patient. 
And I would say that a very reasonable approach for this patient would be single agent rituximab. This is the uh, data from the resort trial. You could tell this patient that he had a pretty reasonable chance of getting several years of remission out of rituximab, whether it was four doses, four doses in maintenance, four doses in retreatment. Uh, certainly, this patient seems to have fairly uh, uh, disease that you would expect would be responsive to single agent rituximab, and I think that would be a very reasonable choice. We don't have upfront single agent data with obinutuzumab, so I don't know that anyone would argue that rather than giving him rituximab times four, we have any data that shows that we should give obinutuzumab times four, although uh, one might argue that, well, it, maybe it's a pretty similar thing and certainly uh, okay to do. We have really no data to, to operate on. And then Jonathan showed you BR versus RCHOP, and again, these are reasonable, uh, I'm sorry, these are well-known data to all of you. Certainly either one of these are reasonable choices, uh, and many people would argue on the basis of this data, for, again, also for the patient's quality of life, to potentially focus on BR uh, given a less toxicity. So I would say that R alone, or BR without maintenance are good options for our patient. I probably wouldn't give him uh, R-CHOP because he, he doesn't have any evidence of transformation. Uh, also, there's no clear evidence that there's an overall survival benefit from CHOP-R followed by maintenance. So again, I think R alone or BR without maintenance should, should certainly be uh, reasonable data as leading up and reasonable approaches leading up to the data that we talk about from the gallium study that I'll highlight and Jonathan did as well. You saw the study design, I won't belabor this, other than to argue that if you're going to use this approach, you are going to use maintenance. So you are changing the nature, perhaps, and perhaps you always use maintenance treatment and that's fine, but if you're not typically using maintenance and you're going to use obinutuzumab, the data suggests that you should be using a maintenance approach with it. So again, you're up front essentially committing this patient, if you're following the data, if you're following the study, to use maintenance therapy because again, all of the data with obinutuzumab in this setting is using a maintenance approach. And again, as Jonathan um, pointed out, if you're operating on the basis of that PFS, you're essentially saying maintenance is the way I'm gonna treat this patient. These were the patients, I won't uh, uh, belabor this, other than to point out to you that uh, starting out with about 600 patients per arm, for a variety of reasons, only about 350 patients completed the maintenance. So you're deciding to do the maintenance up front, but close to half, at least 40% of the patients, aren't gonna proceed all through this for various reasons. So you may think you're gonna be using maintenance for two years, but at least according to this study where that was pretty well defined for whatever reason, side effects, patient choice, progression of disease, only about 60% of the patients that embarked upon this strategy actually finished it for whatever reason, and often that was not for progression of disease. The patients had some toxicity, didn't wanna do it, something else came up. So um, important to keep in mind. You saw the overall response rates, quite similar. Uh, during the time uh, at the end of induction, essentially the same data, 87% uh, response rate, 88.5% response rate, very, very little data in these numbers. And you saw the progression-free survival with, again, you can look at this at, at different times, obviously, but the three-year PFS being about 6.5%, 7% different at three years between the two arms. So this obviously is a positive uh, outcome of the study as measured by PFS at the three-year time point, et cetera. Overall survival, no difference here. And again, you can look at the uh, two-year overall survival, no difference. You can look at the three-year overall survival, no difference. So whether or not there's gonna be a later overall survival benefit, time will tell. Oh, obviously, we're hopeful of that but no uh, evidence of that at this point in time. The safety summary, Jonathan uh, acknowledged all of this. There was a little bit more febrile neutropenia, probably not a big difference. A little bit more in the way of infections, 20% versus 15% of infections. And uh, an important, importantly, overall, there were between three and 4% fatal AEs, no difference between the two arms. But I do wanna highlight this issue in just a second. And these are the patients treated on the trial who died. Each one of these dots represents a patient. And you can see that there are a lot more dots 
in the GB or the obinutuzumab or RB, basically the bendamustine containing treatments, whether you, which, no matter which antibody you received, there were more dots, more deaths, if you received bendamustine plus CD20 plus CD20 maintenance than if you received RCHOP or GCHOP. So the interesting finding here, I think, and it's not easy to explain, is that your chance of, of, of dying over the study period if you got a bendamustine-based regimen w with maintenance was about 5%, and if you got a CHOP-based uh, regimen with maintenance, it was about 2%. So I think this is something we have to keep in mind. It's hard to interpret altogether, but I think the, the issue here may reflect a concern about using bendamustine with maintenance therapy. And again, we've not previously had good data in this regard. These are the most robust data. This is not an antibody-specific phenomenon. I don't think it's any different whether uh, you receive one or the other anti-CD20, but it does raise the issue. And again, a follicular lymphoma patient who's likely to do well, dying within the first year or two because of adverse events is a bad thing. If that happens two more times because you've, you've been a mustine plus maintenance something, that's a problem, and I think we need to keep that in mind. We don't have definitive data, but in my mind, it's a caution about embarking upon a BR followed by R maintenance or, or G maintenance, in this case, uh, in upfront follicular lymphoma. So I think the points to consider of this really come down to that PFS is an accepted endpoint in follicular lymphoma. It's a positive trial. We are trying to improve PFS because we think it's a surrogate for other things. Does it really reflect clinical benefit and quality of life? I think the data are strong that giving a CD anti-CD20 antibody is a key component of therapy to improve overall survival, but at the end of the day, um, which anti-CD20 antibody to affect overall survival I think remains unclear. The other data on obinutuzumab versus rituximab are mixed, depending on the disease area that we're talking about. Is obinutuzumab really a better antibody, or is it a dose effect? What about the patients, and it's a substantial number of patients that choose single agent therapy, antibody alone. We don't uh, have data that say we could swap in obinutuzumab. And again, the applicability to those patients who don't choose maintenance, we don't have data suggesting that there's any benefit to using obinutuzumab if you're not going to use maintenance. And so I think rituximab remains a very appropriate therapy for upfront follicular lymphoma patients. And so at the end of the day, I would say even today, even seeing these data, that R alone or BR without maintenance is a very, either one of those is a very good option for our patient. This patient doesn't need our CHOP. The value of maintenance is limited. The value of obinutuzumab is really a modest PFS benefit and only if we are committed to using maintenance. We don't see overall survival differences. And again, I think at the end of the day, this is purely a quality of life decision for the patient and we have to talk to the patient about the pros and cons of maintenance, the pros and cons of the chemo we choose, the pros and cons of single agent therapy, and again, which antibody um, makes it, how that will affect the patient's quality of life one way or another. So with that, I'll stop and thank you very much.